So our next speaker is Professor Ivan Schuler from the University of California in San Diego, and uh, his topic is neuromorphic computing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I feel really honored to be uh, invited here to give a talk, and uh, usually my friends tell me that they are in the audience, and so I take always a picture to make sure that they are in the audience. Uh, what I will tell you today is a, a story about uh, something that is not finished. It's something that is uh, ongoing, and I think that it is very exciting, the fact that uh, it's very new. Um, the, 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 I, I, of course, I have to, I have to thank my, the, the, my funding agents from, from the Department of Energy, which funded my, my magnetism work most, mostly, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, which funded the superconductivity and for Evanevar Bush Fellowship from the Department of Defense. So, um, uh, oh, I, and I, I always have lots of graduate students that are looking for jobs, but uh, this guy doesn't look any longer for jobs, so you don't have to see his face. This guy doesn't look for a job anymore. He, he, he doesn't need a job, and this guy doesn't need a job. The other guys uh, may need a job, and so please uh, look at their work uh, quite carefully. So, um, what I want to tell you is about the following thing, is about the following idea. The idea is how to make a machine that works like the brain. And what I mean by that is a machine that, for instance, can take something that uh, is starting to be politically very incorrect, even in Spain, which is a bullfight, and extract from this in a gestalt way what is the meaning of this bullfight. Like, get out of it the fact that the essence of that thing is a bull and some people. And, uh, and the idea that I would like to, to leave you is that in order to do this, you have to build something like a brain which has to rely on the existence or on the type of materials which are called quantum materials, which is not quite clear to many people what we exactly mean by that. Now, I, there is a lot of young people in the audience, and they always have the tendency of going to these talks and then listening and everything is done. What I will tell you is something that is not done and that it is going very exciting because of that. So for young people, these are very exciting times. There is very interesting new science that we can do, and there's much to do, and maybe it's even useful. I'm not sure that that's the case, but maybe it's even useful. So I'm always looking for some young collaborators, and so contact me if you're interested. So uh, what I will tell you is about, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the, or two years ago, the Department of Energy asked me to chair a committee that we got together in, uh, in Washington, and we wrote, we wrote this report uh, uh, together with Rick Stevens who, from Argonne National Lab and the University of Chicago, looking at considering what neuromorphic computing, and I will define this in a second, uh, 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 the basic research needs for these are. So computation has its limitations, and I think that lots of people agree with this, that uh, what is called the Turing von Neumann paradigm is coming to an end. So what is this Turing von Neumann paradigm? The idea is that, that every computer has a CPU, a central processing unit, that it has a main memory, and then what you do is you shuttle information back and forth, instructions, or you shuttle data back and forth between these two uh, elements. And that is the way the computer works. Information kind of goes back and forth, back and forth between Turing and von Neumann. Now, the death of, uh, uh, so, so this has led to what is called Moore's Law, and this Moore's Law is something very exciting because it doubles the capacity of uh, our computers every year, and it halves the price. And that's what led to the fact that we have uh, these computers when we have brains actually in our pockets. Now, of course, the death of Moore's Law has been often predicted, but it does appear today that this may come to an end that Moore's law may not be uh, 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 continuing the way it's, it's been going on until now. Now, why, what's the reason for that? The reason for that is in, in there, is, there is many reasons for that, but one of the main reasons for this is this business of the, of the shuttling of information and instruction back and forth between the CPU and the memory. And the reason for this is that there is a lot of information that goes back and forth and back and forth. And that's what is called the von Neumann bottleneck. And that's the thing that I would like to tell you about mostly today, although there are many other limitations in computations. So the other limitations, for instance, are this, that the devices and materials, the limits are coming slower and slower to smaller 
uh, structures. And as they are coming to s smaller and smaller structures, what occurs is the defects in these materials start being important. So you no longer, at this sizes, you could ignore defects. The def uh, defects were not important. But at these sizes, now defects are starting to be important. And they start to affect the way uh, uh, these devices work. So, so, so many of the MOSFETs, as they shrink, they are going to have uh, uh, more and more problems. And so this is another one of the problems. In fact, uh, it turns out that, uh, that uh, the, this, this limit of the computation, there has been lots of discussion about this. And the computation limitations have been discussed by many people. And not only there is a problem with the bottle, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, 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 von Neumann and the uh, uh, bottleneck, but there is problem with devices. There is problems uh, with defects, the fact that the materials are defective. There is even problems with circuitry. And there is problems in, in systems and software. And there are even some fundamental issues that, that uh, are, limiting, uh, are limiting the way, the way uh, these computers work. So the question is, uh, what to do? Now, there have been a lot of predictions. There have been a lot of predictions, and these are predictions of faith, no more. Okay? And for instance, Gordon Moore himself, in 1995, predicted that by 2005, Moore's law is finished. Well, he revised his prediction, of course. He revised it in 2005. He said, well, by 2015, this is going to be finished. And then he revised it again. It in 2025 will be finished. Now, this is the reason that this is, this is happening. is because people that work in this field, like myself, tend to ignore the people that work in silicon and say, the hell with those guys. They don't know what they're doing. But in fact, they do. And they actually, uh, 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 every time they give us some other surprise. But I think there is a general agreement today among pretty much all people that have thought about this problem that Moore's law is going to end up somewhere there in between 2020 and 2025. Of course, there are some people that uh, are able to extrapolate to 2600 and tell us not to worry about until 2600, but I think that that's a little bit, uh, uh, and some of them have run into trouble lately. Okay, so what is the solution to this problem? So that's what I want to tell you about this. So there is three solutions to the problem. The first solution is to just uh, learn to live with it. You know, I went skiing last uh, two weeks ago and I fell and I learned how to live with this. That my skiing is no longer what it used to be. Okay, so that's one possible thing is say, okay, we'll just give up and that's it. It is what it is and forget about it. The second solution is what we just heard, which is a very interesting uh, solution. And it's a very long range solution. And I, I'm sure that my colleagues will agree that this is it's going to take a while until we have a quantum computer. So that's the other second solution. What I want to tell you is about the solution, which is called the neuromorphic uh, solution. OK, so what is this neuromorphic solution? So if you went on the web and you tried to look last year, what is the fastest possible computer there are? The fastest possible computer and the biggest possible computer was this Tianhe 2 computer at the time that I looked at. There may even be bigger ones than this one now. Uh, it has 200,000 processors. It has 12 terabytes of memory and 600 terabytes of disk storage. Uh, so this is, can do all kind of uh, interesting things. It costs $400 million. For reasons which I don't understand, they always have a cable that attached to the, to the. So they have to supply some power through that cable, I guess, to this, uh, to this computer. Now, remember, it costs uh, $400 million. I venture to say that I have made something that is much better than this for $30,000. And I venture to say that many of you have done that. I will show you a second generation of this, uh, of this thing, that I, that this computer that I made for $30,000. It's not the first generation. It's my second generation computer. It's this one. <laughs> OK? Her name is Shoshana Schuler. She's nine months old, and she's able to do something that this computer cannot possibly do. It's able to look inside this toy cabinet that she has and decide, this is what I like, and not something else, and instantaneously do it. And many other things she can do. She can recognize her mother instantaneously. She cannot recognize me instantaneously. She can do many other things. So the question is, what can she teach us? And that's what I want to tell you about. 
So I want to show you a comparison to a biological system. Now, I want to make sure that you understand, since I told you about second generation, I'm not trying, uh, uh, what I want to do is to learn from this process, not reproduce it. So here it is a, a plot of the delay time of devices in uh, computers, and all kinds of computers, even suggested one, versus power dissipation. And if you look at it, uh, and here it is, for instance, uh, in the region of one micron, so say one, one uh, the 10 nanometers to uh, t t uh, 10 nan nanowatts per, per to, to about uh, one, one 100 microwatts, and here it is. The size is uh, going from 10 uh, femto or whatever uh, to 100, uh, 100 uh, milliseconds. Notice here that all the devices that exist they cluster around here in this region of the of the space. However, if you look at what the brain has. It's all clustered in this region, where there is like a big desert of uh, uh, existing devices. There are no devices that work at that. What this means is that the power dissipation, for instance, in the synapses, is very small, but the delay times are extremely long. So let me just now look at the system. So the system that I'm talking about is a data processing system that has some temperature control, some energy delivery, some hardware support, it has some energy production, it has some transportation, some sensory, there is some total number of devices, and there are the, no the number of devices in a processor. Now, lo let's look first at the biological system. The biological system is about 2%, 2% of your body's brain. Face it. 7% is cardiovascular, it's temperature control. 16% is uh, allows me to go back and forth here and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ski badly in the last week. 15% uh, is production of energy. 50% uh, is actually just holding up and transportation. There's about 15% sensory, and there is about uh, 10 to the 14 cells uh, and about uh, 10 to the 11 uh, uh, neurons or, or processors, uh, devices in your, in your brain. So think about it for an instant. If you want to produce an intelligent system, the way this system is produced is totally the wrong way. It is the processor is the smallest percentage of everything. Everything else is 98%. So if, if, this, uh, you, can, if you throw away the 2%, the critical 2%, you're going to be in trouble. OK, so it, 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 there is very important things here, like, like uh, 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 temperature control, for instance, hardware support, and all kinds of other things. Now, this brings us to the following realization. Is let me just compare now this biological system with a solid-state processor. If you look at the biological system, it's made out of, so the brain is made out of some devices called neurons. They have a speed. They have a size. They, they, are somewhat, they have a reliability, they have an interconnectivity, they have a dimensionality, they consume central amount of energy, they have a temperature at which they are able to work. There is an issue of what noise does to it. So for instance, in the quantum computing situation, noise is very important to take into consideration. There is something called criticality, which I'll get to it maybe if I have the time. And there is the architecture of how this works. So notice here, the brain, the device is switched in one milliseconds. The, the size is somewhere between one micron and 10 microns. And let me tell you, nothing here that is within factor of 10 matters. What I'll tell you, the conclusion is still the same. So never mind whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, 0.9 microns. It doesn't matter. The reliability is 80%. Even with 80% of my brain, I can give, still give this talk, no problem. Uh, the co here it is something very interesting. The connectivity of each neuron is to another 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 neurons, which may be something very important. It is pseudo three-dimensional, meaning that there is layers of uh, devices that are stacked on top of each other. I'm told by biologists that it's probably of the order of 10, let's say, layers that there are there. The energy that it consumes is about 10 watts. The temperature range is very narrow. So if you, if you, if you are run too hot, this machine, uh, OK, you start doing nonsense. And if you run too cold, they dig a big hole. 
So there is this problem that the temperature range is very narrow. There is something called a stochastic resonance, which is able to actually emphasize the way this uh, thing works proper, uh, uh, better. And there is, a, at the edge of criticality, I'll show you in a second what I mean, but, but that's at the edge of the criticality. And the architecture is not known. If you look at people that, and biologists and neurologists that look at it, there's all kind of jumble of corrections that is not clear what this thing is, uh, 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 how is this connected. Now, if you compare this with, a, with, a, with an ordinary computer, you find that we can do much better. The computer is built out of transistors, so it's built out of the same kind of devices that we're talking about. However, we can make them much faster. One nanosecond, we can make no problem, one nanosecond transistors. We can make them much smaller. We can make something that has 10 nanometer sizes. We can make them much, much more reliable. And this number of nines that I put in here, I just made it up, actually. I don't know how many nines, but it's lots of nines, OK? So it's much, much more reliable. It's not like 80% there. The connectivity is much smaller. So typically, each one of the devices in, a, in, a, in an ordinary computer is connected to uh, four, five, six other ones. It is also pseudo three-dimensional, so you can build now up to eight layers of silicon devices in CMOS and these kind of things. Here is the clincher. The amount of energy that this computer takes and the calculation of how to calculate and compare this is kind of subtle, and it's not clear how to do this, but it's much, much higher. It's much higher than, let's say, by many orders of magnitude than 10 to the 3 watts. It works in a very, uh, in a very broad temperature range. A computer can work between 5 degrees Celsius, 6 degrees Celsius, no problem. Uh, noise is very bad. Bad. Bad news if you have noise there. And it's far, I mean, there is nothing critical about this, uh, about this machine, and architecture is this very well-defined tooling for Neumann machine. Okay, so let me just think a little bit about this business of, I want to tell you about the uh, energy consumption and about the thermoregulation of this. So if you start thinking about this, and you, you just think a little bit uh, about uh, the animal species. There is viruses, there is bacteria, there is what are called uh, poi poikilotherm. Uh, it took me a while to learn how this word that is. It's cold-blooded animals and homeotherm animals. They, they, these ones can work in a, in a range of about 36 degrees Celsius. This one can work in a range of about 30 degrees Celsius. This one can work in a range of 14 degrees Celsius. And this one can work on the, on the range of about 4 degrees Celsius, as I told you. So the question that you may want to ask, is this just an accident, or is there something more profound than this? And I believe that perhaps there is something more profound than this. And let me show you now, what I'm going to show you is how we can relate this operational temperature, this delta T, not the absolute temperature, but the delta T temperature, to the cognitive ability. Now, that's, this is a difficult one, because um, what is this cognitive ability? There is a thing called an encephalization quotient, EQ, Q, EQ, the encephalization quotient. And uh, uh, this encephalization quotient presumably measures cognitive abilities in animals. So there are these biologists that what they do is they either take animals and they put them into cold and hot water, and they see if they can function. And I'm going to show you a plot of this delta T as a function of this EQ. And this was done by, actually, in collaboration with Juan Trastoy, uh, who is now at Thales. And so here it is delta T as a function of encephalization quotient for a broad range of animal species, pretty much everything we could find in the literature, and over two orders of magnitude on this axis and two orders of magnitude on that axis. It's a straight line with a slope of one half. Of course, it could be that this is an accident. It's possible. And there is nothing I can say about that. But this is quite remarkable, the fact that all animals fall in this, uh, in this uh, line. And this maybe means something profound, that if you want to have an intelligent system, what you want this intelligent system is to work on a narrow temperature range, not in a broad temperature range. So let me look at the differences between the systems. So if I look at the different properties, like uh, the architecture, the number of devices, the connectivity, the devices, the material, the signals, in the biological system, the architecture is disordered. The solid state system is this Turing von Neumann. The number of devices, of course, in the biological system is much bigger, but presumably we'll be able to scale this down at some stage of the game. The connectivity is the big difference here. The number of devices and different type of devices, there are, you know, soma and, uh, and, and dendrites and axons, and, and, and the, here there are some devices such as, uh, 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 such as transistors and resistor capacitors. These devices are all chemical in nature, and that's very difficult to control. 
we would like to have a, a something that is a solid state device. And the signal, here it is mostly by spiking kind of uh, timing of different signals of different intensity and the separation in time. That's how it works. So uh, at this meeting, there have been more, uh, a lot of things. Like, for instance, there, there was a session that it was called post-Moore computing. So physicists are starting to worry about this. But you know, you talk to your friends and say, physicists start worrying about this thing. You know, who knows whether they know what they're doing? Well, let me just tell you, the IEEE rebooting computing is a global initiative launched by the IEEE because they are worried that this whole business is coming to an end. And so the IEEE itself is, uh, launched this, uh, this group, and actually they're having conferences now every year uh, to discuss how to take a holistic look at all aspects of computing. So this is what neuromorphic computing is all about. It's a computationally useful, but not a biologically realistic system. That's what I want to tell you about. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the following. If you wanted to fly from Europe to the US uh, a long time ago, let's say 300 years ago, you would have done the obvious thing. You build something that's lighter than air, you lift it up into the air, and you move it. That's that machine. It's called the Zeppelin. Now, I'm, I'm there to say that very few of you have flown with the Zeppelin recently. But you fly with something that looks more like this. This is called a bird. Well, I mean, I'm talking to physicists, so I have to explain everything. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, now, 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 you see, we, uh, if you remember the beginnings of flight, in fact, people try to fly by flapping the bird, uh, the, the flapping the bird, flapping the wings, okay? <laughs> but you fly with something like this. So it kind of extracts the essence of this and builds something like this. This is what I want to say. So we learn from biology. We don't create a biological system. What we want to do is not adopt, but get inspired. And that's what, I, that's what I'm telling you. Now, there was a guy that used to sit in the White House, this guy. And he, had a grand, he used to uh, 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 put out a grand challenge every year. And one of the grand challenges that he put out a few years ago was, was uh, he said, develop an artificial system that works like the brain. Notice, he didn't say develop something that is exactly like the brain, but it works like the brain. And this was not that long ago. It was in October 2015, and he used to sit in his house. OK, so what is the solution for this problem that he posed to us, this grand challenge? Here it is the solution. It's, it's called the neuromorphic solution. And the idea of the neuromorphic solution is the following. Is the first thing to do is to collocate the memory and the processing. So the transistors and the memory not only sit in different places in space, but they sit on top of each other. The second thing is to do a lot of parallel processing. So how many times the same computation being done? The third thing is to look at the large connectivity. The fourth thing is to look at this coding in spikes. And the fourth thing is, is something called hidden layers. And if I have time, I can go back and explain this business of the hidden layers. But there is some things inside the computer that are able to do the computation for you. Now, there are known implementations. So this is not that new, actually. It turns out that there is known implementation. And many, many companies have, there is, uh, you know, even they have names like Spinnaker and, and True North and things like this. So then you wonder, why, why am I talking about this? I mean, this has already been done. The computer companies are already doing this. So why do it? It's already done. Well, here it is why I do it. So I was very fortunate. Uh, uh, two days ago, I was at a, at a Kavli. So it's very appropriate. It's at, I was at the Kavli Institute in Caltech. And I was uh, there, and I was, uh, we went to visit the JPL. And at JPL, there is this, uh, there is this machine that can look at, uh, at uh, your pictures. And here it is, Duncan Haldane. And there it is me looking at this, uh, at this machine, which is actually an infrared imaging machine. And this infrared imaging machine, notice here, so this is our infrared image from that machine very appropriately. There it is a no prize, you see? White, that means there is almost no activity there. <laughs> and then notice this, notice this other machine is running very hot. OK? So this is literally from two days ago, my recent research. OK? So, so this is the problem. The problem is that there is a lot of local energy consumption. And if you have a high amount of local energy consumption, then this could be a problem. Well, there's a second problem with energy consumption, which is this one. If you calculate what will happen to the evolution of computation, there's something very profound about computation. Think about it. If you make a car that is two times as efficient, you're going to still drive the same car, so you're going to save half the energy. But if you make a computer that is two times as efficient, you'll want more computer power. 
So you're going to want more and more computer power, even if you make them more efficient. And so this is a plot, a, a kind of an extrapolation. It's not that long. You know, it's an extrapolation, 2035, that all energy that is used for data processing will be used up the whole consumption, uh, the whole production of energy of the world. So that's, of course, untenable. So there is two things that are unten un untenable. The local energy consumption, because it gives a lot of dissipation, and the global energy consumption, because there is no availability of that. So some solution there has to be, some, some considerations that have to be gi given to this energy issue. So here is the kind of questions that you may want to ask. You may want to ask, what is the role of architecture? Is the architecture the key to this whole business? And maybe I'm just kind of uh, wasting time talking about uh, devices. Is the interconnectivity the key? And what I find extraordinarily exciting about this, about this uh, field is that there is this kind of fundamental questions that you can ask that there are not well-defined answers to them. The next question you can ask is it the devices and or, or the materials that by, by which you make these devices. Which are the crucial biological properties? That's even not clear. And then the question is, how do you program? Do you want to program this, which is what you do usually with computers? You program them. Actually, neuromorphic computers, you can train them, or you can make them learn. And that is crucial. That is what Shoshana can do. OK? There is this issue about oscillations in the brain, and I'm actually not sure about it. Some people that work in this field think that this is essential, that oscillations in the brain, that there's parts of the brain that start oscillating and other parts coupled to this is very important. So there's lots of people that are trying to couple many devices together and make them oscillate together for some reason. I'm not exactly sure how, why, why is that. But it is important to have some, some kind of an interdisciplinary effort on this. So, so what are the general characteristics? The general characteristic is that you have to have this hidden layer. So what happens is that you have this input from the bullfight, and then inside the brain, there is some limit. Somehow you limit the amount of information. You extract some essence from it. You say, well, what I'm going to worry about it is about things that move, for instance. And the only thing that moves is the bull and the people. And I'll forget about the arena in there. And then the next layer, the next hidden layer, looks at, at separating. The bull is separate from the bullfighter. And therefore, we look at that, we how to separate that one. So there's a series of, e of, uh, of uh, internal layers to this neuromorphic uh, computer by which you are able to separate uh, slowly the final results, which, which is what you want to get. And so, so, so now, what do we want initially to do? Well, initially, you know, I am not insane enough to believe that I can replace all computers in the world. Believe, I mean, I may look to you that I'm totally insane here talking about this, but I am not. So what can we do initially? Well, initially, we can do a bunch of things. We don't want to replace the Turing for normal, and we want to complement it. So there is efforts in which these kind of neuromorphic devices are put on top of a, of a Turing for normal computer. We don't want to do a general kind of a substitution. We want some limited tasks. But we do want them to be computational efficient. And then we want them physically small. And then there is this issue about the energy consumption. We want them to be, energy, the, to, to be very low, this energy consumption. And they have to be reconfigurable. What I mean by reconfigurable is that if something happens to part of the system, the other part of the system can take over. That's what happens in your brain. I think that is essential for this. And of course, this brings me that, therefore, new devices and new materials, new quantum materials, are important. So this is what I, what, what I think the key is. And so that brings me to, to the summary of my talk, is that, uh, that, uh, uh, that I think that the big attractiveness of neuromorphic computing is that has, it has been conceptually proven that it can work. We don't need the proof of working. The second thing, the energy cost is prohibitive, so therefore that's where we have to put our effort, is how to solve that energy cost both locally and globally, if there is any way to do that. So we need an energy efficient neuromorphic computer. The solution is in this thing, so-called uh, quantum materials. I mean, I'm not, you know, there's lots of debates about what we mean by those words, but basically materials that have things like metal insulator transitions. Uh, uh, the, the, the way you can base this, you can base it, and there are several approaches. There are charge-based approaches, there are spin-based approaches, there are optically-based approaches, and there is all these different approaches that we could maybe attack. Now, the big attractiveness about this is also another thing. It is not 
that if you want to develop a neuromorphic computer, you start here, and until you end up with a neuromorphic computer, you haven't done anything. On the way to there, there may be solutions to problems that are of very much importance. For instance, one of the ways of making neuromorphic devices is to move ions around. And one of the major problems in electronics is precisely the motion of ions under very high electric fields. This is called electromigration. This is a problem that was told to me by Ted Holstein in 1976 here in Los Angeles. He told me, that's an important problem, still not solved. If we can say something intelligent about that on the way to the neuromorphic computer, we have done something very, very important. And so therefore, intermediate solutions to this is, is, is very, very important. And I have to talk, uh, finish my talk with, uh, with uh, a saying from this man. And so for those of you that, uh, for, those, for all the gringos in the audience that don't speak Spanish, look to the guys next to you, because I'm not going to translate it for you, okay? So this is, uh, he says, Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. This is by Antonio Cipriano, Jose Maria y Francisco de Santa Ana Machado y Ruiz. Thank you. Again, I'm happy to take some questions. Yes. Yes, it's one person. That is one person. <laughs> <laughs> So the idea is that, that uh, these computers have to work very close to a well-defined energy profile. So if you think of the, of the brain and of the, of the memory like, a, like an energy surface, okay, it has to be in a very narrow energy, energy range that it has to work on. And if you go away from there, it won't work. Okay, that's what is meant by criticality. I, I can see from here uh, into the darkness. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hi. I would like very, very good, uh, very funny uh, talk. Thank you. Now, well, just to ask about this concept of neuromorphic computer, do you think could be useful some concept of biotechnology that could be helpful for create this next concept of neuromorphic computer? For example, just you know that nowadays you have these bacteria that can be used like for data storage for some generation replication of this bacteria, or like the new technology of CRISPR genome. Well, I mean, you know, the, the problem with this whole business of the neuromorphic computing is that there is many solutions that have been suggested, and the nightmare scenario is that we will never agree to one solution, and then everybody's going to kind of claim that their solution is the best one. But to answer your question directly, even at this meeting, there was a talk about some people that are doing, for instance, trying to make devices with liquid gating which is kind of close to, I mean, it's somewhat uh, farther away from what I'm talking about, and, 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 do, and do things that, that way, you know. So, but the problem is that, uh, that for a solid-state physicist, the control of things that are kind of more biological, more chemical, is very difficult to think of. So I'm not exactly sure how to answer the question whether that's, that, you know, whether that's possible. Uh, Thank you. I apologize, but we're running uh, terribly late, uh, so I have to cut the questioning off now, and uh, uh, th let's thank Professor Schuller again.